So the title of the talk is Low the Local Smoothing Estimate for the Cone in R3. And um, yeah, Hong, it's all yours. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for being here. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, local smoothing for the wave equation in R3. Um, let's you be the uh, solution to the linear wave equation with initial beta equals to u naught. And the first derivative zero. Then uh, the solution u can be uh, written as u x t equals to I know for uh, PDE people, there, uh, some, uh, there are another way of writing out the uh, solution using cosine, but this is the one uh, that I'm going to consider as a solution. And now um, assume furthermore that the support of the free transform of the initial data is on an annulus of radius r And then the question we ask is, um, what can we say about the LP norm of space time? Um, for the time from one to two. So the, this um, LSR is the local smoothing constant depending on R and also depending on uh, P and the dimension D, but I will not write it here. So the, this constant is so if the smallest constant for any U satisfy the above um, conditions. Then what can we say about this constant? Can we give an upper bound? Um, as we can see that uh, this solution U can be viewed as a function whose Fourier transform is supported on the light cone. And we'll see this later. Now let's look at an example. Uh, since U naught has Fourier transform supported on the annulus of radius capital R, then we can think u not as roughly a characteristic function of a ball of radius one over r. And this is because of the uncertain principle and this ball of radius one over r is the smallest ball we can uh, see given that the Fourier support of u not is on the annulus of radius r. Then so let's see. So this is time equals to zero and we have u naught, a bump function supported on a small ball. Then the u at time t is, um, is some weight function c times the characteristic function uh, is roughly times the characteristic function of um, radius on the annulus of radius from t to t plus one over r. And then this c is the weight. How do we determine the weight? Well, we have the uh, energy conservation the L2 identity. 
the L2 norm of u at time uh, t equals to the L2 norm of the initial button. And using this, we can determine this weight t. So that now, as time e t equals to one, we have u x one is supported on this, essentially supported on this thing analog, and then t equals to two. an even larger one. But this uh, thickness one over R. Now, um, as we can see that is essentially a weight times the characteristic function and the weight when the time from zero to two, it becomes smaller and smaller because we will have the, uh, this L2 energy conservation. Um, so our question is to estimate the LP norm. Let's see a, a question about what happens for a fixed time. Mm. For a fixed time, it was uh, when d equals to two, it is a result by a parallel. When p is from one to infinity, it says that the u with uh, at time one has LP norm smaller than r to the one half minus one over p. So this is absolute value. And then times the LP norm of u norm. So it's, if we plug in this example, well, a small modification of this example because the wave equation is time reversible. If we set our time t equals to zero here, and then the t equals to one here, two, three. Then for this example, one can show that when p is from two to infinity, the result of a parallel is sharp. When p is from one to two, we will set uh, t equals to zero here and t equals to one here and show that it, his result is also sharp. So this is sharp. And now we can ask for all, do we have all time estimate? Can we find some constant depending on R such that this all time estimate holds? Um, well, to, to understand this question, as we already show that the uh, mentioned that this wave equation is time reversible. So if we, if we make this time to be infinity. So this focusing time to be infinity. And we start from uh, t equals to zero way, way down there. Then in this way, we will show that uh, we cannot have um, this all time estimate for any r here. So this is, we should put infinity. Now, um, 
It's an observation of uh, Chris Sock says the following. So Chris Sock make says that if uh, for from time interval from one to two, if uh, we average over this time interval, we should have a gain of regularity that's better than this one. Um, so specifically, he made the following conjecture. This is smaller than the local smoothing constant times the LP norm of the initial data. And the local smoothing constant when P is from two to four, um, this local smoothing constant is smaller than R to the epsilon. When P is larger than four, this local smoothing constant is smaller than r to the one half minus um, two over p. So, um, so here one can see that when p is around four, the r is epsilon. So there, there might be an epsilon here. Um, Sorry, just a small question. Mm -hmm. This is in, in 2D, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a very good question. I forgot to add when D equals to 2. Thank you for your question. And then, um, so one can see that um, when P is from 2 to infinity, this uh, we can remove this absolute value. And then this 1 half minus 2 over P is a gain of regularity compared to r to the one half minus one over p. So as we mentioned that this uh, fixed time estimate is sharp. So uh, that's why this local smoothing effect is interesting. Um, Then uh, Sock himself in the same paper proved that mm, L, the local smoothing constant is smaller than R to the one half minus one over P minus epsilon P for some uh, epsilon P positive when P is from two to infinity. And then um, a year later by uh, Markenhop, Seeger, and Sock, they showed that when P equals to four, this local smoothing constant is smaller than R to the one over eight. Mm. So as we mentioned that P equals to four is a critical P. So the, the um, proof for the most interesting P with a, a, some a loss on the power of R. And they also made a square function conjecture. And they show that the square function conjecture implies local smoothing conjecture. So the square function conjecture is the following. Now consider a truncated light cone.
so gamma equals to uh, c absolute value c is from uh, 1 to 2. So, and then we are interested in those functions with Fourier transform supported on the 1 over r neighborhood of this truncated light cone. We have a one over our neighborhood here. And this function f can be viewed as a rescaling, uh, some kind of approximation, approximation of the rescaling of the previous u, our solution u. So this one over our neighborhood is related to the frequency r. And then we can decompose those uh, one over our neighborhood into sectors theta of angular width r to the minus a half and length length one and then thickness one over r. So this theta is the um, largest is one of the is one largest um, convex body that we can insert in this neighborhood. And that's the reason how we choose it. So our decomposition goes like this. And then this is finitely overlapping. And then we choose a smooth partition for unity, sum of, of phi theta equals to one on this thin neighborhood. And we define our function theta as Fourier restricted on theta. So the square function conjecture is such that one can estimate the uh, L p norm, L4 norm of f in R3. So this cone is in R3. It's smaller than R to the epsilon times the L4 norm of the square function. Um, so this four is related to the, uh, the critical P being four for the local smoothing uh, conjecture. One can see that the square function conjecture is pretty sharp for a generic function. So sharp. In the sense that we, we take an, any F satisfying the above condition and define capital F as sum over F theta times sigma theta, where well, sigma theta takes value plus or minus one with equal probabilities and for different theta is iid. Then by Kintrin's inequality, if we take the expectation of the elf p norm of capital F, this is equal to the LP norm of the square function of small f. But we can see that uh, this capital F theta equal, has absolute value equals to the small f theta. So we have that. And this, this is, shows exactly that for a generic, a generic f in this sense, the square function the LP norm of square function equals to the LP norm of F. So this is also what makes um, proving this square function estimate uh, difficult because it's sharp for a generic function. That means that in, in the proof, we, we can't afford to lose anything. Um, now let's go back to the local smoothing uh, estimate. In the year 2000, Tom Wolf um, 
it shows that for large enough P, we obtain uh, a sharp bound on the local smoothing constant L as PR. This is for P greater than 74. And to do so, he introduced the idea of uh, decoupling. Um, decoupling inequality is, a, is an inequality very similar to the square function um, estimate. It switches the LP norm and the little l to sum. Um, strictly speaking, what uh, Wolf introduced is a P instead of a two here, but um, later Bokan and Demeter, they proved a sharp decoupling for a little L2 sum. So as one can see, if we have the square function estimate for certain P, then we will automatically, automatically have a corresponding decoupling estimate because the right-hand side of the square function is smaller than the right-hand side of decoupling for P greater than two, greater or equal to two. And then the Borgen and Demeter, they made a breakthrough. In the year 2014, they showed that these six are is smaller than r to the epsilon. And as a consequence, they proved local smoothing estimate for p greater than six. But this is also the best we can do via decoupling. Uh, so remember the sharp estimate for for the local smoothing is p greater than four. So we still have a gap from four to six. Uh, we didn't know what happened. Um, here I just want to uh, spend a little time uh, discussing decoupling because uh, decoupling, both gamma diameter decoupling in the theorems have lots of consequences, um, including the the strict has estimate for the uh, for the Schrodinger equation on Tori and several other uh, consequences in number theory. So, um, in higher dimensions. We also have a local smoothing conjecture. So this critical P is 2D over D minus one. And it's well known that local smoothing implies, um, implies restriction estimate. In RD, And this implies a uh, KK estimate and so. So local smoothing estimate um, implies a sequence of um, open problem in free analysis. Um, and all those uh, problems in R3 or higher is extremely difficult and it's wide open. Even though the um, restriction estimate and KK estimate in R2 was solved a long time ago in the, uh, in the 1970s but the local smoothing uh, conjecture in R2 plus one remains open until last year. And so our theorem says that uh, the 
square function conjecture in for the cone in a three holes. And we also um so so does the local solution conjecture in R three. So um maybe before I proceed to the proof, are there and any this questions? result is for all P or just uh, between four we, and six? We, we prove for P greater than four. That's the sharp range of P. And also for the square function as conjecture, we prove for P equals to four. Sorry, do you mean P greater than six, uh, three or? I mean, um, four is in 2D and this theorem is in 3D. So I'm just trying to- Sorry, find this is uh, three, two plus one. So that's what I said, two plus oh, one. Oh, okay, thanks. I will. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yeah. Okay. So now um, I will try to uh, use the rest of the time to discuss the idea of proof. So uh, previously, uh, we, when we try to uh, prove the square function estimate, then we, the right-hand side is a square function of f theta, where f theta are sectors of angular width r to the minus a half. Um, if we imagine theta as a huge box of dimensions one times one times one, then uh, this essentially becomes f. So what we are going to do is we are going to draw those uh, bigger sectors that not, not necessarily lie in the thin neighborhood. But let's say this is tau. Tau has um, angular width s and then thickness s square. Where s we take gradually from r to the minus a half to one. And then we define the square function gs as sum over f tau d tau equals to s. This means the angular width of tau is s. Now use our notation g1 is roughly f square because the Fourier supporter of f is contained in a ball of radius about, about one. And then use our no notation gr to the minus a half equals to sum over f theta squared. And if we rewrite our square function estimate using this notation, what we want to show is G, the L2 norm of G1 is smaller than the L2 norm of G R to the minus a half. Well, here, this notation means we ignore the R to the epsilon. Sorry, did, just remind me, D of tau or theta is what exactly on the picture? I don't understand. It's an uh, angular width. So this, this, the tau. Um, so we, we have a, we have a light, we have a light cone. And then this is the angular width is S. That, does that, is this clear? Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so 
we want to estimate G1 by uh, GR to the minus a half. So we kind of wanted to say that if G1 is smaller than GS for some smaller S and, and gradually go from GS to uh, reduces this S. Um, so now let's take some S between one uh, and R to the minus a half and see what is the L2 norm of GS? What can we say about it? So there are lots of question mark here because we don't know whether it's true. Um, re recall that GS is sum over F tau square. And then, well, here we see an L2 norm. What we can do is we can take the Fourier transform, use partial and consider the F, the L2 norm of its Fourier transform. Now the question is, what, what can we say about the Fourier transform? Okay, sorry. Before that, I, I want to say a little bit about what, what is GS. Mm. So first of all, F tau square is by the uncertainty principle, since tau is a sector of dimensions S and S square and one. Now F tau square is roughly sum over pi t with some weight depending only on t. And t is parallel to tau dual. And tau dual is a dual uh, plank of dimensions. So in this direction is dimension one, then in this direction is one. And in this direction is S, then in the same direction is one over S. And similarly, in this direction is S square, then in this direction is one over S square. This is tau dual. Um, by the uncertain principle, uh, F tau square can be viewed as roughly sum over some weighted planks that's a translate copy of this tau dual. So uh, GS now becomes some uh, weighted is now a sum of weighted planks uh, of the same dimensions, but of different orientations. For example, there might be another thing that goes this way, say tau prime two. Now estimating the L2 norm of GS um, is roughly says that we estimate how much those different weighted planks overlap. So this can be viewed as sort of incidence estimate. Now, now we are ready to proceed to our proof idea. So we take the partial as we often do in free analysis. And then we study uh, what is the free transform of GS. So again, we can study, study this by us thinking of what is the free transform of F tau absolute value square. And one thing is that we know the free transform of this is supported on tau tilde, which we define as tau plus minus tau. And this is the Minkowski sum um, because F tau is supported on tau. 
And then uh, let me just draw a picture of how it looks like. So we have our tail here. Then this tail tilter is roughly of roughly the same size as tail, but uh, centered at the origin and slightly longer. So let's say this is uh, four. Then the Fourier transform of um, GS has support um, lie on the union of those tau tilter. Then we, we kind of think we have a light cone and we stick those tau tilter to the light cone. And so up here, they don't have too much overlap for different tiles, the, the, the tiles children of different tiles, but around the origin, there are lots of overlaps. Um, I, I try to find a picture online to see how do we visualize this. And now I found this. Uh, that's, so this, those light, those light uh, are like uh, tiles children and they, they are like spaghettis. But uh, so this is, should be viewed as some kind of planks and they have lots of uh, um, intersections around the origin. So now, uh, so to understand the L2 norm of GS Fourier transform, uh, we need to understand how to decompose the, the support. Um, there are, so the, the idea is the following. Mm. We decompose tau tilta into high, low frequencies. For high frequency, we are going to use some kind of L2 orthogonality. And for low frequency, we hope to reduce to um, a similar problem of some coarser scale of the different scale and use induction of scales. So that's the uh, rough idea for um, what do we do with the L2 norm of GS. Now, for the high frequency, uh, let's look at a toy case. So if we define, um, if, if we define our high frequency as this part, so we define high frequency as tau delta set minus a ball of radius about one centered at the origin. Then this is roughly e equals to tau. And as we can see that from the way we decompose uh, tau, they are uh, essentially disjoint. So we have in, in the case of high frequency dominate means that 
and high dominant uh, means that this L2 sum, L2 norm is dominated by the integral outside of the unit ball. Now by our previous analysis, those support, they have, um, they have this joint support. So we will have some L2 orthogonality for the uh, L2, for the F tau square. So we, this is bounded by sum over tau, little l for sum of this uh, integral. So this is using the assumption that high frequency dominant and in this definition of high frequency. And uh, usually when we have this L4 sum, um, well, we, we can do lots of things and we can uh, view each individual F tau as a new F and proceed the same analysis. Um, however, um, if we define our high frequency in this way, it is true that uh, we can deal with the high frequency using this orthogonality and L for sum, but for the, re for the remaining frequencies, say tau theta intersect the unit ball, um, it's, it's not easy to uh, consider them as low frequency and just use induction of scales. So we need to, um, we need to decompose into high frequency in a slightly different way. So the way we actually do it is here is our, our tau delta. And then we decompose into those like O like shape. So this we call it capital theta tau sigma. Well, sigma is some parameter between um, one and s. We consider those smaller planks as uh, length sigma square and width s sigma. We denote them as um, capital theta tau sigma. So now our real definition our real definition of high frequency is um, capital theta tau say one side uh, set minus capital theta tau say one over 10. Um, this one might be, uh, we can choose it to be four, but it's the same. And then we apply a geometric lemma. Saying that for different tau, this high frequency part is uh, essentially disjoint or finitely overlapping. Um, let's so this is uh, roughly this shape. And we can kind of imagine if we put those, um, those red shapes together and stick it to a light cone, then, then they are uh, finitely overlapping. This is an ele elementary geometric lemma, but uh, it takes a few lines to prove it. So I will not prove here, but using this geometric lemma, uh, we can define the high frequency as what we define over there. And, and we still have 
when the high frequency dominant case, we still have this, um, uh, the L2 norm of GS is dominated by this little L2 sum. And then we can keep going with F tau instead of F. Now for the low frequency dominant case, here we uh, can also consider an extremal case saying that lowest frequency dominant. Well, lowest frequency dominant means um, here our tau uh, sigma is from S to one. Lowest frequency is when sigma is around S, then this capital theta sigma is about a ball of radius S square. So in this case, um, I claim that uh, we, we will have GS square less than GS square and that square. Um, this is when GS is dominated by the lowest frequency. So this is the hypothesis and this is our claim. And uh, let's imagine for a second if we have our claim, then what, what, what can we do? So recall that the square function estimate is um, estimating g1 um, by g r to the minus a half. So um, here we show that gs is smaller than uh, gs square for some smaller, for, some, for s square smaller than s. Then we, we kind of think we are one step closer to proving the square function estimate. And that's why we, we have some gain in the lowest frequency dominant case. Then um, the way we do it is, um, so G, the low frequency is e roughly GS convolve with um, phi Vs square check. The inverse Fourier transform of phi Vs square. Well, phi Vs square is a, is a bump function supported on the small ball of radius S square. And then this one is roughly by the uh, non stationary phase. It's roughly the volume of this ball times the characteristic function of a ball of radius S minus two centered at the origin. And then GS is sum over phi F tau square. Then then we have, this is roughly the same as an L2 average of sum over F tau square at a, on a ball of radius S to the minus two. Now we can use uh, those, uh, this local L2 orthogonality. To, sh to show that we can further decompose F tau into F alpha. Well, alpha has angular width S square.
And then that's, that's essentially the key step in the uh, low frequency dominance case. Um, and for those intermediate frequencies, um, the method are sort of uh, combining both the highest frequency and lowest frequency dominant case. So what we actually proved um, for the square function estimate is we, we prove an even stronger uh, estimate where the right-hand side incorporate both the right-hand side of this low frequency and this high frequency. So it's a kind of a mix of L4 and L2 sum. I think I, think I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hong. Thanks.